Okay, uh, so uh, we would like to introduce you today into uh, the um, theory of trust. We also discuss the Tenchbook project. And um, let's start. My name is Daniel Kuiper, and uh, I work for Oracle. I am software developer and grab my tenor, and I will be doing this presentation together with. My name is Daniel Smith. I'm the chief technologist for After Solutions. I think I got this one. Okay. Um, and so today, Daniel and I will be presenting on trench vote. Uh, so just a quick agenda. Uh, I'm going to give an introductory to integrity and trust. Daniel will cover dynamic launch. I'll cover trench vote. And then Daniel will talk about the upstream work that we're doing. And then we'll do a Q&A session after that. Oh, higher. There we go. All right. Sorry. All right. Uh, so integrity and trust. Um, so Trenchboot is specifically uh, interested in the uh, trustworthiness of booting. Um, so as a result, a frequent question we get is, why is secure boot not enough? Um, to answer that question, what we're going to do today is you know, go over a common in, uh, understanding of what trust is, and then using those trust constructs, uh, uh, break down secure boot and dynamic launch and discuss that. Um, so trust, trust is a human social concept. Uh, basically, anytime we want something to act on our behalf, we entrust it, we give it trust. Um, this is the same thing with computer systems. When we want the computer to do something on our behalf, we give it our information. We're trusting it to do the right thing with that information. Um, so. When we look at this trust, we need to find something that is the core of that. That's our root of trust. And the root of trust, we need to be able to understand why we can trust it. And that is where we come into uh, something that's called strength and mechanism. So the, meaning of, the meanings of trust is a very good paper written back in the 90s. Um, they went through uh, just the human concept of trust across all, all areas. Um, they specifically focused on an area called uh, what they called system trust. Um, this is in mechanical systems or computational systems, which is what we're concerned with here. Um, one of the th key things they said there is that in order to believe or have trust in, the, in your system trust is that you need impersonal structures that uh, enable you to uh, know that the uh, action you're asking that to do on your behalf is cor does it correctly. Um, these impersonal structures, there's two of them that you can have. You can have structural assurances and you can have situational normality. We're interested in structural assurances, and specifically for a root of trust, we want ones that are, have high degree of strength, right? Um, to know that we can believe in that root of trust. So what is a root of trust? So according to the TCG, they defined it as a component that we expect to, or it must always behave a certain way because if it misbehaves, we have no way of detecting that. So what does that mean in terms of strength of mechanism? So from a strength of mechanism, we are worried about, uh, and this term comes from uh, mechanics, you, you worry about whether or not under stress, the mechanism you're relying upon will fail or succeed. So in this case, we are worried about whether or not our root of trust will misbehave. And the best way we can do that in computational systems is trying to drive those root of trust to be immutable. Uh, anytime you introduce mutability, that is by the means by which uh, somebody can create a stress that will cause it to fail on you. So once we have a root of trust, we now can rely on that root of trust to make evaluations of other components within the system. And when it meets the right criteria, we can then impart that same trust to that component. That is a transitive trust, what the TCG refers to as a transitive trust. You can repeat that on and on recursively and that gives you a chain of trust. And that, that uh, terminology of a chain of trust rooted in a, uh, in a root of, or anchored in a root of trust is a very good analogy. Because in real life, if you have an, an anchor with a chain, if the anchor is in something in a soft foundation, a little stress will cause it to release, right? We want these anchors to be rooted hard. And then when your trust chains build up, every time you do your uh, transitive trust, you're inducing mutability into your trust chain. That means you have, create a risk that your chain can fail on you. So at the end, we want to be able to build these uh, root of trust with these shorter chains 
that we can then uh, give uh, statements about the integrity of the system. So integrity. There's really two kinds of integrity we, we need to be worrying about. There's our load time integrity and our runtime integrity. Um, and we need a, the root of trust to be able to make assertions about these. Um, the interesting thing is that there's a, there's a subtle difference, a subtlety about the load time versus runtime. Um, everybody knows that secure boot is a, is a boot time, a load time one. Uh, dynamic launch from TCG typically is a load time, but you can actually use it as a runtime if you want, uh, which we'll discuss later. And then IMA. Uh, most people think of IMA as more of a runtime, but it's really load time. It's measuring what was loaded at the process execution. At no time does it actually inspect the process while it's running. That's where your runtime integrity will come into, where you want to be able to establish and reestablish the integrity of a process as it's running. Um, so that way you can continue to have trust in what you have running. Uh, and typically the two you see in those are kernel integrity monitoring and process integrity monitoring. So now that we've built up a root of trust, how we can expand that root of trust to uh, components, use those to uh, give you integrity, I'm going to let Daniel touch on uh, dynamic launch. Thank you, Daniel, for this theoretic uh, introduction. Uh, I would like to look a bit closer to the dy dynamic launch. Uh, first of all, the terminology, this is quite important here because it is very conflated. And here in this table, we have a quite nice comparison of different terminologies, terminologies used in a different uh, specification. The most important one, which discusses the generic idea of the dynamic launch, is, is the uh, specification prepared by TCG. And uh, it discussed the generic idea itself. Uh, the uh, Intel specification and the AMD specification focus on um, vendor implementation of the, of the dynamic launch. The problem here is that, uh, uh, that all three documentations, as you can see, use different terms for the same thing. So if you read it, you, you, you can feel confused. This is normal, don't, not worry. And I'm really surprised why, why, uh, why uh, did it happen, because uh, uh, in the TCG committee, AMD and Intel participated. So I'm not sure why they invented new terms for, for the same things. A good example is dynamic launch. As you can see, uh, in TCG documentation, it is simply called dynamic launch. Uh, in Intel TXT, it is, uh, late, co sorry, it is called late launch. And in the AMD, it is called secure startup. The same thing is for DL event. You can see this is called as enter or SK init, and so on and so on. Uh, there are also some terms which doesn't have relevant terms in the vendor spe specification like DCIRTM. In general, in this presentation, we will be using uh, terminology, terminology proposed by TCG, but if we are referring to specific implementation of, uh, uh, a specific uh, implementation of dynamic launch, then we will be using terminology uh, of a given uh, vendor. So let's look at, uh, let's compare UFI, uh, Secure Boot Trust, and Dynamic Launch Trust. So if you start the machine, you have a something like, uh, you, you get a, a machine started and uh, uh, all firmware is taken from, from, uh, uh, from the flash. And initially, the sec phase uh, in the UFI is executed, which uh, does uh, basic, basic initialization of, uh, of the platform. And the control is passed from the sec to PEI. And then PEI, that, uh, uh, does uh, measurement among others. Uh, and as, as you can see, the CRTM is not measured un until during the PEI. Uh, so SEC and PEI phases has, uh, must be trusted. Uh, and CRTM is of SEC and PEI. So these are self-referential. Self and the trust relies, uh, relies on, boot, uh, on, uh, on boot flash and the TPM to protect the measurements. Uh, and the uh, DXC uh, phases enforces UFI secure boot verification. So we have three kinds of root of trust here. The flash and TPM f uh, forms something which is called root of trust for storage. Uh, we have a root of trust for measurement which is built from uh, second PAI. 
and uh, root of trust for verification, which is formed from SEC, PEI, and uh, driver execution environment. Uh, the situation uh, co looks completely different in case of dyna dynamic launch, because uh, here we mostly depend on the, on the hardware. How it works? In, 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 at first, we have something which is uh, called DC preamble. It can be a part of bootloader, or it can be, uh, it can be part of currently running OS. Uh, and uh, DCRTM is taken initially by the CPU, and uh, the, the, uh, the result is uh, stored in, in the TPM. Uh, in the case of the Intel, there is also additional method, uh, authentication method of uh, DCE. Uh, just in, uh, Intel CPU just verifies the signatures of, uh, of uh, the DCE. And if, uh, if uh, after that, uh, the control is passed to DCE, and DCE also measures the DLME and put the results in the 2TPM. Uh, how, let's look into today how the uh, dynamic launch uh, uh, work. So initially, the CPU obtains locality number four, and uh, the, uh, the TPM, uh, and it clears the TPM uh, the DRTM PCRs. Uh, all CPUs are, uh, are all, all CPU interrupts are disabled, and uh, this, the CPU protects the DCE uh, from DMA access. And uh, AMD and Intel use uh, different technologies to do that. Intel uh, uses something which is called cache RAM. AMD uses something which is called device exclusion vector. Uh, then after that, DC, DCE is, is measured by the CPU and uh, the result is stored in PCR 17 before the execution. And here also there is a difference between um, uh, uh, Intel and AMD implementation. Intel provides ACM for, uh, for every platform and every ACM is signed by Intel. In case of AMD, the owner has to provide uh, the, the DCE but uh, you are not able to verify uh, the signature. There's no such mechani mechanism to verify the, the signature of DCE. Uh, after that, the DCE enters the DLME, uh, uh, is the, the DMA protected, measures, and then executes it. So as you can see, in case of uh, dynamic launch, uh, uh, sorry, the, the result is very high integrity assertion of DLME. Uh, in, in this case, in, in case get have the dynamic launch, as you can see, the firmware is uh, removed from this, the, uh, the TCB, except SMI handler. So, root of trust is mo mostly uh, mounted in, in the hardware, and uh, firmware, which is usually buggy, is removed from the picture. And at this point, I would like to hand over to Daniel. All right, thank you. All right, so. Trenchboot, the, the project itself. Um, so Trenchboot originated from an idea I had back in 2014 when I was implementing a forge seal capability into OpenXT to uh, be able to forge seal the platform um, on an update. Uh, in, the, in OpenXT, we use T-Boot to launch the Zen environment. Um, in order to accomplish the forge seal, we needed to be able to get to in certain bits of information from the measured launch. Uh, in TXT terms, in the dynamic launch. Um, and in the way that T-Boot was constructed in conjunction with Zen made some things very difficult. Um, we weren't able to get to the TPM event log. That is actually, it's housed inside the ACM's heap space and that's actually um, blocked out of the memory map. So Zen will not allow you to access it. Um, boot services. It's still the day, there's a conflict on who should be terminating boot services. If you follow the specification, the TCG's uh, dynamic launch specification, boot services is supposed to be uh, terminated before you do the dynamic launch. Right now today, T-Boot does it inside of it um, before it hands over to the target system. And in our case, for this uh, uh, situation for OpenXT, TXT, or I'm sorry, Zen likes to have access to boot services as, as well. So we have this conflict here. Um, T-Boot can only measure what was loaded into memory with it at the time that it was started. Um, only the multi-boot modules. There, there's nothing else that it has the knowledge of how to do or even uh, considered. Um, 
and it only had one action, attestation action. It basically can do a policy enforcement on a PCR, predetermined PCR manifest. Um, it had, and that's the best you can get out of it. Um, and then it only works for TXT. There was an attempt to pr uh, consider putting AMD support in it, and they turned it down. So, you know, we need to be able to, like, specifically on OpenXT, we needed to be able to support um, both AMD and, and Intel. So, the motivation continues. So, because um, doing this is very important, we need to make sure that we do this correctly. We need to take the time and make sure that we have a nice, clean way that we've launched the platform that we make these strong assertions from. Um, so, we, uh, the project isn't meant to focus on solving this problem for everybody. Um, and then in the past, dynamic launches have been used just for the initial boot phase. And the fact is, is that dynamic launch can be ran multiple times through the entire life cycle of the CPU. All right, so, uh, sorry, so, uh, of a power on, power off sequence. Um, so it's an opportunity to establish the current integrity of the platform at any time, if you want so chose to do so. Um, and on top of it, in the last you know, four years now, four or five years now, launch integrity ecosystem has gotten extremely rich. Um, there's numerous roots of trust, the roots of trust have evolved in terms of measurement, secure co-processors have shown up, spy interposers are in place now, you've got hybrid solutions starting to come out, and then on top of it, you have vendors adopting these capabilities into their products. Um, so we want the open source system, uh, open source ecosystem to have these things as well. So Trench Boot is a cross-community integration project. There is not a one thing that is Trench Boot. We're trying to bring these capabilities to all of the open source uh, projects that are involved in this. Um, one of the questions I've gotten is where did I get the name? So when, when I was working through all of this, starting back in 2014 and looking at all of the, the launch integrity system and, and the hardware and everything else, it's, it's a muddy mess. Um, and you know, just trying to find a way to unify all of that in a way that all open source projects could use is just, it, it, I joked at one point that it's like, I gotta strap on a pair of boots to make, wade my way through this so that several other people have gotten stuck in. Um, so at the end, the purpose is to develop a common unified approach to building trust into the platform during the launch phase of the, plat uh, um, of the platform. Um, and then work with the, the open source community to the various projects to get this unified approach adopted by all of them. So that way uh, you wind up with this ecosystem that any uh, open source kernel and potentially uh, proprietary kernels could use this to launch themselves if they wanted to. So this brings us to the first capability we've been working on, which is what we're calling Secure Launch for Linux. So Secure Launch for Linux is the uh, attempt to bring the uh, to enable the Linux kernel to be dynamically launched by both AMD and Intel. Um, specifically, the focus is on a first launch scenario, which is what everybody is very familiar with. You're using uh, you know, the dynamic launch as part of your boot cycle to establish the, the initial uh, integrity of the platform. But you can actually, uh, we're looking at runtime integrity as well, runtime launches. So that way you can actually um, use this to launch your up kernel upgrade through a K-exec. You could launch a, an integrity kernel that could sit there and dynamically inspect your system. Um, or if during a shutdown, you want to make sure you want to establish the integrity of your platform before you persist everything to disk, such as in embed environments, this is a chance to, for you to do that. So the, uh, to compare that with the existing op uh, ecosystem of dynamic launch, um, like I said, there's been numerous attempts to, to bring dynamic launch into the open source community. Um, a lot of these, or actually all of these, have been focused purely on the uh, first launch use case. Um, the Intel-based ones are actually exokernels because they try to persist themselves for the entire runtime of the system, and in an exokernel fashion, they hook the, uh, uh, the sleep states to handle uh, de dealing with the fact that your trusted kernel went into a sleep state. Uh, from my perspective, that's not the appropriate approach, but we can talk about that later. Um, and then they have a limited or no attestation capability built into them at all. 
So the first use uh, case, first launch use case, uh, standard use case, everybody knows this. Uh, the difference that we're doing with Trench Boot is we're going to expand on it a little bit. So we're going to properly terminate boot services by the bootloader and then handle the EBS uh, handoff using Linux's existing EFI capabilities to uh, launch itself after uh, exit boot services. Um, Google has this uh, amazing project called Uroot in which they're building uh, these tiny init RDs for a variety of solutions um, for embedded bootloaders and those. So it was a good means for us to build a flexible way of doing measurements and attestations during this launch phase. Um, the current focus right now is to be able to measure block devices, files, and system information like DMI, and then to be able to take those measurements and do attestations and then establish the integrity of your platform before you allowed your target system to start running. Um, and then uh, we will be using the KXEC interface to do the launches. Uh, when we exit, or when, we are, when the secure launch phase is completing, we cap the PCRs on all platforms. That's a means by which we can say we're done. Um, Intel provides us the extra capability that I wish AMD had, which is the S exit instruction, which allows us to basically close off access to the uh, PC DRTM PCRs, so that way the measurements can, those PCRs can no longer be extended after we're completed. Um, and that closes up the first use case. So to, to uh, give a basic walkthrough, walkthrough of it, um, right now, Grub will be able to take measurements if you so choose to. It's optional of everything that's about to load into memory to start the late launch, or the dynamic launch, excuse me. Um, it will load either the secure loader or the ACM, depending on whether you're an AMD or uh, Intel. It'll load a Linux kernel that is capable of handling the dynamic launch, the secure launch capability. And the, it will then call the respective event, late launch, or dynamic launch event, um, at which point, the ACM will hand off, do its business, that's proprietary to Intel. It will hand off to, directly to the setup header, or the setup code inside the kernel. And the secure loader, we have a project where we're building one and making, uh, which is gonna be, uh, is open um, for AMD, which will basically set up the environment and transition into the setup uh, code for the Linux kernel. Inside the set setup header, we, we are, Daniel will cover this in a little more detail, We'll take the measurements of uh, what's necessary within the kernel. So we'll, we, right now, we're uh, when the piggy has been expanded into the VM, li VM Linux, we take that measurement, we measure the init RD, so that way we have the, at least those two measurements of the things that we're gonna give execution to before we turn them over. Um, once you get into the init RD, it can then take, it will consume a policy file, which will tell you what you want to measure. It will measure those into the TPM and then execute your target runtime. And with that introduction, I will turn it over to Daniel to cover the status on upstreaming. Oh, thanks, Daniel. Uh, I would like to discuss how this idea of the trench boot map uh, to, the, to the current upstream project. But at the beginning, I would like to say something about history of the project. The project was initiated by Apertus Solution, and uh, the company invited the cooperation Oracle and FreeEmbed. Uh, FreeEmbed is a small company in the north part of Poland, which focuses on uh, developing uh, open uh, source firmware for embedded platforms. And in general, Oracle focuses on Intel uh, implementation of TrenchBoot, and FreeEmbed focuses on um, DMD implementation. So how this, uh, how, how this whole idea of, of the TrenchBoot project applies to uh, specific projects? First of all, the, the Grub. It was decided to uh, provide uh, a DC, uh, DCE preamble for, for the Grub at first, because uh, this is the most common bootloader in current deployments. So uh, we are uh, we are working currently on on on, on the pro on this project, and we have to do some uh, some changes uh, uh, in the code. First of all, we have to inter extend the uh, Linux boot protocol with a special additional kernel infrastructure, uh, which I will discuss a bit later. Uh, we have to also add some uh, additional co commands to identify the secure launch phase. 
and uh, additional commands to load the DCE modules for Intel and uh, for AMD separately. And uh, we also have to add some DL event relocators, one for Intel S Enter, another one for DMD SK init. AMD development is farther along uh, than Intel currently. Uh, we haven't published patches yet because currently it doesn't work simply. We, de we do some tests, we have some difficulties with Intel, um, quite big difficulties with Intel, but if everything works, then, then we will release uh, first version of patches. SL boot. Uh, this is a small piece of uh, code which we took or, uh, took from from the T boot, because we needed uh, something uh, uh, um, to test, uh, which will work, uh, let's say, almost out of the box. So we decided to just strip T boot, uh, remove all unneeded pieces, and just uh, leave a, a pre launch code. Uh, this is. Uh, this solution just work uh, on Intel because T-Boot was developed uh, on Intel, and this is interim solution. We currently have this code running. We have currently system boot boots, but there are some problems with uh, with uh, network or something like that. So currently working on that. This is interim solution. We are going to move all that code uh, to the grab and pot, post it upstream. The kernel info patch. Uh, I was mentioning in, uh, uh, this thing in uh, the GAB slide. Uh, we have to we have to change uh, Linux boot protocol. We have to we, because we have to, to pass some information from the kernel to the uh, to the bootloader. In particular, this is entry point to uh, a secure launch code, which will be in, in setup uh, uh, part of the kernel. And after discussion with HPA, who is maintainer of uh, Linux boot protocol, uh, we stated that it, that it, it is needed to, to extend, uh, 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 to, to extend uh, the protocol by, uh, by adding kernel infrastructure. Uh, we have to do that because uh, currently setup header has very limited uh, size and we are closing to uh, we are using just final bits of, 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 of this structure. So uh, after some discu discussion with him, we decided to uh, introduce this new structure which will, be, will, will not have uh, such limitations and can be extended in the future without any issues. And uh, I have posted two patches on uh, uh, Linux kernel mailing list. Uh, uh, HPA is, is quite happy with, uh, with uh, the implementation, but he has still some comments and I'm going to take, take into account uh, his comments uh, in version number three. Uh, secure launch phase. Uh, this, uh, this is a code which will be uh, put into the Linux scanner. Currently, there are two sibling patches uh, in development. Intel, uh, to get, uh, sorry, uh, Oracle together with our, our Portus solution focuses on the Intel TXT implementation. And uh, AMD uh, Secure Startup implementation is uh, done by FreeM, but with some help from Apertus Solution and uh, Oracle, and as I know, with AMD, AMD <laughs> currently. Uh, summary of changes. Uh, so we have, to, uh, we have to introduce some changes into compressed uh, part of, of the kernel. First of all, uh, we have to introduce uh, SL entry point and uh, we mean minimal code to uh, hand, uh, handle, entry, handle entry from DL, DL event. We also have to add some uh, minimal implementation of the SHA and uh, the TPM. But, uh, and this code currently exists, but uh, after some reviews, we realized that it is possible to optimize uh, the TPM logic and uh, make the codes, uh, make the code uh, smaller. And uh, we also uh, have to add some uh, setup, uh, some, some code to uh, do processing uh, of handover from the L event in setup part of the kernel. And your stuff. Yurut is a project uh, 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 made by, by uh, Google, and uh, it is just a simple uh, init interface for DLME, and we will call it a security engine for the first launch. Uh, we have to add a unit app uh, uh, that functions as a core engine, 
for processing a policy file uh, which describes evidence collectors, attestors, and what launcher to run. We have to add a, a measurement library that provides a core set of evidence collectors. And we'll be using uh, currently existing booting capabilities in the Euro to implement a KExec launcher. And we are going to provide uh, attestation in the LME uh, in, later phases, in, in later phases of, of development. Uh, when we discussed the, pro uh, uh, the project among, among the people, it appears that there are more and more features needed, but we are not able to, do, to, uh, to, to provide all of them uh, at first step. So there, are, there is a um, growing to-do list, and first of all, we, uh, first thing uh, which I think is uh, worth mentioning is extending the KExec with DC preamble implementation. This, we, this way you will be able to uh, uh, re restart a dynamic launch from the run running OS. Uh, also we are considering adding DC, DC preamble to the IPXC and uh, also we are considering extending some, some things uh, in Zen. Uh, we are going to make to uh, it exec, uh, ex make it to be executed from the uh, KExec uh, as a daily me, and we are also going to add DC preamble to the Zen, which I think is quite interesting idea. So that's it. Uh, questions and answers. Hey, uh, so you mentioned being able to get away from having the boot firmware as part of the TCB. Uh, what about EFI runtime services? So you don't necessarily need runtime services, yes, right? Yes, you do. For what? Uh, PStore, um, changing boot configuration, uh, primarily those, but there's a few other cases where, oh, um, firmware update. You're going to need to be able to use boot services and uh, runtime services in order to configure the firmware update on next reboot. Right, but those, do those operations have anything to do with the execution of your, of your operating system that you're running? Uh, in that calling them if they're malicious could result in the firmware tampering with the state of the kernel after your measurement. Right, so at that point, you're, you're discussing a runtime issue as opposed to a boot time, right? I've established the integrity. I didn't mm -hmm. rely on the firmware to establish the integrity of my operating system. I relied on the CPU to establish the integrity of what got loaded. That's my load time integrity problem. Now, if you want to tackle the runtime integrity problem, that's a much larger problem, right? It's very difficult, right? You have to be able to inspect things and try to decide afterwards whether or not, um, or after things have started executing and things have changed in terms of the state of the application, you have to be able to inspect that and make uh, assertions about that. So, yes. Um, that problem is not a dynamic launch problem. That is a platform problem, period. It doesn't matter whether you're, you've done an, only an SRTM boot or if you've only done a dynamic launch boot. If you've got corrupt firmware, you've got corrupt firmware. Whether it was corrupted, uh, whether it was corrupted as part of the launch or it was corrupted after execution, it's still an ex a runtime problem. So is the model that even in a dynamic launch environment, I should be looking at the SRTM values as well to make a determination? Yes, you about should always. You should, because okay. you're trusting the SRTM to have initialized the platform, right? So you still have that. You, um, we try to minimize that as much as possible with the dynamic launch, but at the end of the day, the sec phase is what put the memory timings in there. If that was corrupted and it decided to screw with that, you're, you're done, right? There's nothing we can do. So. The, we still care about the SRTM, we still can, uh, but the key point here is that we want to remove and reduce the trust chain that was used to launch your operating system. So we're, we're trying to increase, I see your mind. We're trying to increase the, the, the integrity in the platform, um, but it's a holistic problem. That's the whole point that we talked about in these roots of trust. I, I, I shied away from it, but the fact is, is like, you know, the trust is there. You can't drive it to zero, right? You can't decide that it's optional. It's there. It's the question of whether or not it's an implicit or an explicit trust. If you're only going to be implicitly trusted, then um, you might as well just implicitly trust the entire platform. We care about trying to make that trust explicit. We're trying to create contracts between us and the hardware to, to make sure that everything in the running state is correct as best as we can. Thanks. Right? 
if I may add something. Uh, as far as I know, you are able to avoid some runtime services uh, uh, calls. For example, you know, some companies try to avoid these calls which are needed to change the boot order of, of the platform by using external device like a BMC and then you are able uh, to, to set the, the, the boot order of the machine using a open BMC, BMC or something like that. Then you are not able, sorry, then you do not need to use uh, runtime services to change that order. But in case of P Store, of course, it is much more difficult, I think. Um, I, I guess a couple of things. Let sure. me start with the runtime issue. You may, I'm Monty Weizen, by the way, from, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. So I know something about this. Um, you made a statement earlier about the SMI handler. Yes. So that's up to the OEM. Intel TXT does provide support as of 2015, I think. Yeah. Support for the STM. Yep. It's entirely up to the OEM as to whether to provide it. There is some open source uh, STMs available if that's an area. You're, to me, the SMI handler is much scarier yes. than the runtime UEFI handler. Yes. So that's the thing I'd be worried about. Oh, I, um, I agree. Yeah, so I anyway, just wanted to make that correction. Uh, DL entry is the generic term that we used in the spec yep. for S enter, so they're synonymous. Didn't want to you know, put S enter into an industry um, standard specification, and there was one other um, correction I want to make, but I'm drawing a blank on it right now, but yep. yeah, I could probably give you some help in this area if you would, <laughs> Thank you. If you would like. I mean, yes, you're correct. So just to touch on your point, so for those that aren't aware, there is core boot. They actually are implementing TXT support as well as STM support. So what Monty was get, touching at is the fact that when you do a dynamic launch, an S enter on an Intel TXT platform, and you have an STM present, the ACM will actually interact with the STM to establish the integrity of your SMI handler. Um, until more uh, uh, mainstream providers adopt that, Dell, HP, um, you know, we don't have anything that, that can handle the SMI. Everybody, everybody's beholden by the SMI at this point, the handler. So, all right, any other questions? Any comments? Comments? Nope. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, guys.